This is a really important concept that I'm about to go over. So just really pay attention here. So let's go over this scenario and I'm actually gonna give you a little bit of history with this. Hello, welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala and today we're gonna to be talking about cord blood gas examples. So if you haven't seen the first video on exactly what the cord blood gases mean, I would really recommend that you go back and watch that. I know I say that all the time, but honestly, this time I really mean it. By the end of this video, we will have covered some really common blood gas combinations. So even if you're not doing anything with the blood gases in the unit or whatever else, at least you'll actually understand what's going on and you'll be able to explain it to your colleagues. Okay, since you're obviously at this point not going to go back and watch the previous video, I'm going to sum up three important points for it that you need to know. The first one is, is that the pH of the arterial cord gas is lower than the venous cord gas. So the arterial cord gas is more acidotic than the venous cord blood gas, always. So the lower normal end of an arterial cord gas of the pH is 7.24 with a base of minus 6. For the venous pH, the lower normal end is 7.32 with a base of minus 4. Okay, let's go over the first example. I'm going to give these examples to you without any of the kind of medical background because I don't want the message to get missed. But example one, as you can see, the venous is 6.85 with a minus 23 base. The arterial is 6.8 with a minus 25 base. Right, let's delve into this a little bit more. So I know that you're all looking at it thinking this is just really bad, but what else can we see? First of all, the gases are different and the arterial is slightly more acidotic than the venous. So 6.8 versus 6.85 and minus 25 and minus 23. So we can assume that these gases really do represent the artery and the vein and that they were correctly obtained as well as labeled. So, as you've both seen, they're obviously both very acidotic. So 6.5 and 6.8. This is much lower than the 7.1 kind of cutoff for acidosis and really less than 7 if we're strongly considering cooling. And this is true of both the vein and the artery. We also do have some respiratory acidosis, so a CO2 of 90 and a CO2 of 95. Again, like I keep saying, even though this shows that the baby was probably under stress, it doesn't really in any way predict any developmental outcomes. So generally, when we're looking at gases, we're just looking at the pH and at the base. But the fact that there is such significant metabolic acidosis, so minus 23 and minus 25, means that this baby is really under a lot of stress and has probably been lacking oxygen for some time. So remember, the criteria that a lot of institutions use for cooling is a pH of less than 7 and a base deficit of more than minus 16. So basically, minus 23 and minus 25 definitely fit into that category. So if I saw a cord blood gas like this, even if I was told that the baby looks good, which is honestly very unlikely, but I would still go and make sure that I did a good neurological exam on the baby and probably get a gas on the baby because these numbers are so bad. In the meantime, you don't necessarily have to start passively cooling the baby, but at least make sure that the baby doesn't get hot. So what could have actually caused this? Well, because the venous as well as the arterial cord gases are both so bad, then this is probably likely to have been placental in origin. Because as we keep saying, the venous gas reflects the placental metabolism. So even the venous is really bad here. So something really bad must have happened with the placenta. Maybe there was an abruption or where the placenta literally got ripped off the wall of the uterus or there was like a uterine rupture or something. So altogether, very bad gas. Okay, example number two. What do we have going on here? So our venous gas is 7.05 with a minus 13. An arterial is 7.05 with a minus 13. You can see that there are very slight differences in the CO2 and the O2, so 63, 64, and 17 and 18. But just remember, anytime you sample anything in blood, there's going to be some variability. So if you, for example, checked sodium in exactly the same blood batch, like five times, then there's a really high chance that it's not always going to be exactly the same value. There's always a little bit of variability. So most likely these were collected from the same vessel and most likely 
they were both collected from the vein because as we keep saying, the vein is much bigger than the arteries and it's much easier to access the vein. So generally, if you have exactly the same blood gas twice, then you have to kind of think they're probably both venous. So in this case, what do we actually do with this gas? Well, you can see it's not great. pH of 7.05 with a minus 13. And remember, the kind of cooling criteria that you use a lot of times are a pH of less than seven and a base of minus 16. So they're getting pretty close to that. So the way that I would interpret this, if you're kind of hedging whether to cool this baby or not, and honestly, you don't have to have blood gases that are like pH less than seven and a base of minus 16 to cool. Really the most important thing is an event and the neurological exam. But for the purposes of this discussion, if you're wondering whether you should cool this baby or not, you probably shouldn't get this blood gas and be like, oh, you know what? We don't quite meet criteria. The pH is 7.05, we're above seven, and the minus 13 is above minus 16. Because we know that the arterial is always going to be more acidotic than the vein. So for all we know, if we actually got a good arterial blood gas here, the pH may have been less than seven, and the base may have been less than minus 13. So definitely this cord gas should not stop you from cooling, just as honestly, even if you wanted to cool and this was the arterial, you'd cool anyway. Okay, example number three, let's go over these gases. So what can you see straight off the bat? The venous is 7.28, the arterial is 7.35. Okay, so they're different, which is good. So we probably appropriately got specimens from two different vessels. But as you can see, the venous is more acidotic than the arterial blood gas. So as you can see, the pH of the venous blood gas is lower and the base deficit is lower. So most likely these were just mislabeled. So really this is the arterial and this is the venous cord blood gas. What's another way of being able to tell that this can't be the arterial blood gas? So we've already said that we really only look at the pH and the base because the CO2, the oxygen, the bicarbonate it's recorded doesn't in any way correlate with future development. However, looking at the oxygen can be helpful in this scenario, and that is in the arterial cord blood gas. It's been shown that even if the mother was put on oxygen, so whether she was intubated or just given extra oxygen, the PO2 in the arterial cord blood gas can never be above 38. Remember, this is the blood coming back from the fetus. It's never above 38. So if you have an O2 above 38, then one of two things has happened. Either there was a gas bubble in the specimen and you've just got an erroneous number, or, and this is what we're suspecting in this case, it was actually a venous blood gas. So here, what do we do with these specimens? Really not a lot. The only thing that we can say is that they were probably mislabeled, but they're both pretty good blood gases and we don't have to really be worried just based on the cord blood gases. Okay, example number four. This is a really important concept that I'm about to go over. So just really pay attention here. So let's go over this scenario and I'm actually gonna give you a little bit of history with this. And that is a mother who was in labor full term, ruptured at home and then had a cord prolapse, rushed into the hospital and was taken for an emergency C-section. So let's look at the blood gas. The venous is 7.24 minus 5, not horrible. The arterial is 7.1 and with a minus 10. And the baby came out completely limp, barely had a heart rate and was extremely aggressively resuscitated. Unfortunately, despite extremely aggressive resuscitation with epiboluses and intubation and the whole nine yards, the baby passed away. And Towards the end of the resuscitation, they got a pH from the umbilical vein of the baby, and it was 6.61 with a minus 28. Way, way, way worse than the cord blood gases. So what do we actually think happened here? For everybody that watched the first video, at the end, I gave an example of a cord compression and what happens with the blood gases there. And here you can see that at least part of this is probably because of cord compression. So normally in cord compression, as we said, if the cord is being squeezed, then the vein normally gets squeezed much sooner than the artery. So what ends up happening is, is that the placenta is no longer delivering the oxygen to the baby, but 
the artery isn't squeezed and the baby is now extracting more oxygen and getting more acidotic. So generally, in kind of an early, not a complete cord compression, your arterial pH is going to be much lower than your venous pH. And here you can see that at least the cord gases partly can be explained by that phenomenon. So you can see that the arterial pH is basically 0.14 lower than the venous pH. Normally it's about 0 0.05, 0 0.08. Also, the base is minus 10, so it's five lower than the venous base, which was minus five. Normally it's only kind of one to two milliequivalents per liter lower. So here we would look at these cord gases and say, okay, there was probably some level of cord compression. But still, that doesn't explain why the baby's first gas was so atrocious and why we were unable to resuscitate the baby. So what can we say probably happened here? Most likely, there wasn't just a partial cord compression, but total occlusion of the cord. And that can be expected in a prolapse, where it wasn't just the vein, but also the artery ended up getting completely compressed and squeezed. So what does that mean? That really no blood is going from the placenta to the baby, and no blood is leaving the baby and going towards the placenta. So effectively, at this point, the baby is not getting any blood at all. But what can we say about the cord gases? Because it's not coming back from the baby, it in no way reflects what's actually happening in the baby. As you can imagine, before there is a complete occlusion of the cord, there's probably going to be a partial compression beforehand. So most likely you're going to see some difference in the vein and the artery before that blood stops altogether. So this really does not reflect what's going on in the baby because there is a complete occlusion of the cord. And that is a really important lesson for you all to realize that if there is a complete cord occlusion, then the blood isn't going to the baby and the blood isn't coming back from the baby. So the cord blood gases do not reflect what's happening in the fetus. So don't always feel reassured by getting okay-ish cord blood gases. And our last example, example number five, also another really important concept that you have to understand from cord blood gases. Again, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history in this one. So a full-term mother comes in and she reports that she's kind of been leaking a little bit of fluid for a couple of days. When she gets to the hospital, they confirm that she has indeed ruptured her membranes and they start augmenting her. She's not really in, she's in kind of early labor. During the process of delivery, she spikes a fever of 102 and the baby becomes really tachycardic. The baby delivers shortly thereafter. The baby comes out kind of foul smelling, but the APGARs that are given are nine and nine at one and five minutes. Okay, so the cord blood gases, the venous is 7.34 with a minus five, and the arterial is 7.18 with a minus 14. Big difference. Okay, so if we had a different history and we were kind of thinking that maybe there was a tight nuchal or the baby was having D cells with every contraction, maybe we could make the argument here that this is some sort of cord compression. But we don't really get that from the history. And like we said, the Abgars were pretty good, were excellent, nine and nine. And the venous blood gas, 7.34 and minus five, doesn't really reflect that anything bad was going on with the placenta either. So what could be going on here? So let's go back to the history. The mother had prolonged rupture of membranes, a fever, and the infant was tachycardic. Most likely the mother had chorioamnionitis and looking at everything, I would be very concerned that this baby was actually infected as well. If the baby was infected, then obviously in trying to fight that, the baby's extracting more oxygen and producing more acid. So in this situation, it's possible that this baby's bad arterial cord blood gas, again, which reflects the baby, probably is an indication that this baby is infected or septic, the 7.18 and the minus 14. So really nothing to do with what's going on with the placenta or the cord, but rather more reflective of what's actually happening to the baby. I will say just as a caveat that a lot of times, even if a baby does have an infection at delivery, they won't necessarily be acidotic immediately, but this baby's probably been brewing that infection for quite some time. Okay, and that's it. Hopefully you've watched these two videos and you have a really good idea of how to interpret cord blood gases. And if you do, then you're already way ahead of the curve because like I keep saying, for some reason, 
people don't normally really understand them fully. Anyway, if you'd like to, then please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in neonatal content. In the meantime, we just want to say thank you. We really appreciate you being here.